welcome to the Top Order Podcast. We're talking about match 33 of this one day international men's world cup. This is a lineup you don't often see on the Top Order Podcast. Uh, Binksy, Raj, and Baldy in the hot seat this morning. Uh, we'll talk about India's dominating batting. Uh, we'll talk about the man of the match world, and we'll talk some stats as well. All coming up on the Top Order Podcast. Stay tuned. Well, boys, match day 33. So, um, yeah, no real spoilers here, but India sitting pretty now at the top of the table, seven wins uh, from seven, pretty healthy net run rate. And um, you've got to say that this looks like, a, yeah, almost game over for Sri Lanka in terms of their potential qualification uh, for the semi-finals. We'll start, I guess, at the start, shall we, with, uh, with India's, um, India's batting. Um, another one of these games in a pretty, yeah, pretty decent heat, I think, at the Wank Haiti and um, Sri Lanka sticking India into bat and then, uh, yeah, chasing a little bit of leather, Raj, which you must have enjoyed watching. Shubman Gill, Brett Coley, Sharis Iyer, all in Nick for India. Yep, uh, those two in particular looked looked really good. Uh, I guess if we if we start right at the top, uh, that Madhushankar ball to, to Rohit Sharma, the second Ooh. ball of the game. It was an absolute peach, uh, but that's about where it starts and ends uh, from me for the praise for for Sri Lanka. Madhushankar, to be fair, he actually bowled bowled well while being a tad expensive, but uh, in 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 context, relation to the other part of the bowl parts of the bowling unit, he was he was actually very very good. His maiden five for, um, yeah, Kill uh, Gill Coley, uh, they they batted really well. Sri Lanka did have their chances early on. Both of those mm-hmm. men dropped uh, for under 20. Uh, it was actually the pitch. You know, this is going to sound funny because India scored 357, but I watched most of that innings. It was actually not that great for batting on. It was very two-paced, and unless you were hitting the ball dead straight, uh, there was a lot of ball hitting, ball hitting bat on the up, a lot of closed bat faces with leading edges. Um, and like I said, yeah, Sri Lanka had their chances, but just did not take them. And those are chances that need to be taken. What do you reckon, Baldy? I completely agree with you. I mean, you have, only have to look at how many dismissals of the Indian batters were caught at cover in the top four to to, to acknowledge your point. And the, and the wicket was a little bit sticky. But once the batters were in and they got a chance, it was just a question of how much India would make Sri Lanka pay. Sri Lanka were their own worst enemies in the first 10 overs, dropping both of those guys uh, inside that power play. And they both went on to make 80, 80 plus. And it's the first time I think that India have uh, gone past 350 without a guy making 100. It's one of the highest innings for India without batters uh, going on to make a century. All three of those Indian batters going on to make uh, 80 plus that you mentioned. Uh, Madhushankar, look, continues to impress me in this World Cup. He has emerged as a potential superstar for Sri Lanka. I don't want to make comparisons to Chaminda Vast, but those are the comparisons that are being made already. And you had a look at all of the skill that was on offer from him last night. We know he can swing the ball early doors, but that off-cutter to dismiss Rohit was, as you say, Raj, an absolute peach. So he showed us an extra set of skills last night, uh, turned the ball in his fingers both ways, and picked up his maiden five for and look good on him. He has been a shining light in an otherwise, I think, for Sri Lanka, pretty disappointing World Cup. And we'll get on to the binary batting in a little bit. And that and that was a highlight for them previously, uh, has now turned into a low light. But yeah, Madhushankar's five for. If you get Rohit, Gil, Kohli, Shreyas Iyer, and Sky in your maiden five for, that's a, that's a pretty good bag to talk to the grandkids about. It was, and just just sort of building on your point there around Aya and a point you made there around sort of getting in, his innings was actually very, very good. He came in on a difficult pitch to acclimatise to, and he he actually settled in really quickly, and that half century came off 36 balls, uh, and, you know, it's all about driving towards that that 350, where obviously, you know, we called it being a 350 World Cup uh, early on in the preview. Uh, No complete lie i think Stu was the only one who believed that but um 350 i think is what you're aiming for and that that's what 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 i did and pushed india towards that on actually a very difficult pitch um whilst we're talking a little bit about madashenka i've got to point this out guys and i really want to get your your thoughts so quick info obviously run their little mvp um program on the website so in a game where india win by 302 runs 
Crick Info have named Madashanka as their MVP. Now, Baldy, please tell me this is, you know, some kind of glitch in the algorithm matrix because I, I just don't see how the MVP um, under any criteria can be, mm. uh, yeah, from a team that's that's lost by 300 runs, even if he does take five for, um, and particularly when he takes five for and with all due respect, goes at eight and over. Thoughts? Yeah, difficult one to rebut there. You've you've really won this debate early doors with your opening salvo. Uh, the only thing I can think of is he was that much better than all of his teammates. He was far more valuable to Sri Lanka than the you know relatively even contribution from all their batters. But at the end of the day, uh, I think you'll find that 18 is better than 80 as far as runs conceded is concerned. So if anyone in a bowling sense is going to be winning MVP, I think it should be perhaps Mohamed Shami. Um, well, so I can't disagree I, with you there, mate. I have a bit of an answer for you, actually. So I, I did look into this. There is a, oh. a pre, there's a pressure index, which is the underlying part of this algorithm. And I'm feeling that, that at the moment. That that takes into account the the, the quality of the bowlers, quality of the batters uh, that are currently batting, and and Baldy named the the players that he yeah. he, he dismissed, uh, and in the positions which which he dismissed them. So that has been factored in as. Uh, difficult. Uh, it's hard for Xiaomi, I think, to 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 replicate that. Uh, you know, when he came into his his bowling innings. Well, well, given that the guys that Xiaomi dispersed only made ones and zeros, I reckon he may have recoded the algorithm on the fly there uh, to to run himself out of MVP contention because it was look a spectacular spell. Yet another spectacular spell from Mohammad Xiaomi. Can we just cover him off quickly? I think it's fourteen wickets now in this World Cup. I think he's only played three or four games. He came in, of course, after the Pandya injury. And now he has 14 wickets at 6.7 at a strike rate of nine. Like that's some under 13B stuff when you've got like an under 15 playing down type of situation. Mohammed Shami, now that he's come in for this Indian side, I know it is a balance question for India. They get so much more out of having Pandya at six and that extra bowler. But the fact that now they can have Mohammed Shami in the team. I mean, he's just been awesome for them. Let's just roll off a couple of stats and records. Uh, now the most World Cup wickets for an Indian. Uh, he's got 45 goes past 44 for Javagal Srinath and Zahir Khan. Uh, he has the most full wicket hauls uh, in ODI World Cups of any bowler. Uh, he joins Mitchell Stark as the only bowlers with three fivers at ODI World Cups. Uh, he's just been superb. Um, yeah, and as I said, a strike rate of 9.4, that's not a misprint, an average of 6.7 and an economy of 4.2. So he's just been he's just been awesome uh, in this World Cup, Mohammed Shami, and proving that, you know, you don't need to bowl at express pace to be successful in India, providing you put the ball in the right areas, you stand the seam up and you do a little bit with the early doors. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, Bordy. And I, I just, uh, yeah, watching him against England the other night as well, I just... I don't think there's anyone better at finding any little advantage in terms of conditions than Mohamed Shami, and I'm talking about all, you know, all cricket, all all bowlers in in the in the world game currently. If there is a little bit of nip there, he will absolutely, um, absolutely find it. The, the, the way he presents the seam is just. Um, yeah, I you know I, I whisper this very very quietly. It's as good as uh, Jimmy Anderson. Um, in terms of yeah, in terms of his, his wrist and seam position, which yeah is the highest plaudit I can I can pay any seamer. Yeah, and and I tell you what, Boomer's not far behind him. That delivery early doors yeah. to get um, the inform uh, Nathan Pasanka <clears throat> or Pathan Nasanka, I should say, in first cherry and gone, just set the tone for India. And, and Sri Lanka were just you know they were never in the races really in this game, were they? Mm. Can we clip uh, Binksy talking about Shami and, and James Anderson uh, together in, in that sentence, that context? It was great. Clip it. Yep. Put it on YouTube as a short, please. Um, yep. So I'm going to take a slightly different line. Shami got the got the headlines. Bumra is, is, is Jasper Bumra, but I actually think that uh, Siraj was was actually the most devastating bowler for me uh, on this wicket. His his wickets of Kunaratna, Mendes, and, and Samarak Rama in his first seven balls was actually absolutely outstanding. He bowled incredible areas. Uh, him especially got the new ball to swing. He got it to really talk. 
uh, Shami and Boomer more more off the pitch, but there was a little bit in the air, but more off the pitch. Mm. Uh, Shami is a, is a point of difference. He gets the ball to swing in the air, and it, w- it was actually just a completely different vibe from, from that first innings. Uh, the swing, the seam, uh, impeccable areas. We talked about Madashanka, even that first ball to, to Rohit Sharma, that wicket was actually from lack of swing because he kept, kept it going straight and then cutting away slightly. Um, I, I actually, yeah, massive plaudits for me, for from me, for uh, Siraj there. I think he bowled really well and it's going to cause some real headaches, but good headaches to have for the yeah. selection uh, team. And, and huge headaches for the semi-final and final opponents. India now locked into a semi-final spot officially now mathematically. And... The only real weakness so far in India's lineup, it seemed, is that Siraj was slightly below uh, the level that, that Bumrah and Shami were performing at. But now, Raj, as you say, he's been outstanding as well in this fixture. And Sri Lanka have unfortunately played India into yet more form uh, for them at the right end of the tournament. Yeah, absolutely brought in. Look, I guess we've asked this question a hell of a lot. We go into... Um... Yeah, I guess we go into you know a busy weekend of cricket, so we've got that you know, double header on the on the Saturday. Um, but India, I was talking to a couple of guys at cricket practice about this last night, and um, we got a, a few Sri Lankan lads at our club, as you know, Baldy. They were pretty optimistic going into last night's um, game, and, and a couple of the, the the Indian lads were talking about how they think they thought India would win, but they think they're gonna they're gonna crash out in the in the semis. Um, I, I guess that sort of, you know, probably perennial tag that, you know, they're not, you know, they're not great in knockout cricket. Um, but I, yeah, I, I just can't see a permutation where they don't win this tournament at the moment, the way that they're, they're playing with both bat, um, bat and ball. Um, but yeah, anyone can, is there anyone that can spoil their, their party on home soil, do you think? Well, I think South Africa have got all the tools. They've got all of the explosiveness in their betting to match it with India run for run. Uh, South Africa's bowling attack has looked good in recent times as well. Maharaj has been getting turned. Shamsi got a four for in the game that he played recently. So on paper, South Africa can match it with India. We've yet to see a team really match it with India on the field. It would take a pretty spectacular crash for India to all of a sudden be bowled out for 130, 140 or or something like that. I do think that New Zealand can match it with India, even though New Zealand were were well beaten by India in the pool stage earlier this month, because New Zealand can, and I don't mean to sound disrespecting to New Zealand or New Zealand fans, New Zealand can drag India into the type of game that New Zealand want to play, i.e. a slightly lower scoring, closer encounter. And I think New Zealand when they get India into that situation, as I said on uh, Fan Wars a couple of weeks ago, are as good as any side in world cricket at making sure that they, that they do what they need to win in those kind of situations. So don't write New Zealand off yet. Yes, they're riding a bit of a, a mini slump at the moment, having lost three on the bounce, but they'll bounce back. And if they get into a semi final against India, I think New Zealand will hold no fear of that Indian side, despite the fact that they've got 120,000 people behind them. Uh, in the stadium, a billion people watching on TV and 11 cricketers who are as good as any India have ever trotted out in a World Cup. The, the major thing for me, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about it, I guess, in the in the sort of review that we do of the tournament, is the way the semifinals are structured. There's no benefit for those teams like India or South Africa who have um, done really well uh, in the round-robin stages. When it gets to the semifinals, everything resets, and once again, any team can beat any team. I think that Australia is the only team that have really put India under a little bit of pressure. The way they had that first match yeah. where they, they took those three wickets up the top very early. Uh, any team really can beat any team in this in this um, competition. If India had played the lineup that they play are playing at the moment without Hardik Pandya, Pandya and they're three for under 10 in that situation again, it's a completely different story, uh, you know, against Australia in that that first match. So really any team can beat any team uh, when it gets to that situation. I am a little bit um, concerned about New Zealand's performance and, and just looking at the table now, I never thought I would say this, but we really are relying on the Netherlands to make sure that they beat in Afghanistan tonight so that Afghanistan don't or have a harder or slimmer chance of making those semifinals and increase our chance. Um, and then obviously looking forward, there's the New Zealand-Pakistan game tomorrow night, 
uh, which will be, uh, you know, it'll have a large impact on, on what that sort of number four spot looks like going forward. Anything from uh, you, Binksy, on the table? Yeah, not, not necessarily on the table. I just wanted to throw a question to, to both of you boys with, you know, your parochial uh, one-eyed views of your of your own uh, your own nation. So some injury concerns for um, for New Zealand. So I think Carl Jameson was called into the squad for Matt Henry as but as cover. So I don't think he's been um, yeah been added to the squad yet. They're going to give Henry obviously the chance to to get himself right. Kane, um, the last time I saw him on 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 uh, the video tape, um, if they still use video tape, I don't know, but still had a big cast on the um, on the hand as well. And then from an Australian perspective, Baldy, if you want to come in after, you know, after Raj, you've got some concerns as well. Mitch Marsh flying home and um, Glenn Maxwell joining the Johnny Bairstow Hall of Fame with a golfing injury. Um, so, you know, this late in the tournament, you've got to make a call as to whether you, re- you, you know, you replace that injured player. He obviously can't come back even if he, um, even if he recovers. How much of an impact is that for, for, for you boys going into a busy weekend of cricket and, and, and obviously still some permutations as, as to whether or not you definitely make those those semis? Yeah, look, it's always a danger, uh, you know, when you actually carry some injuries into the tournament. We carried Kane Williamson and Tim Southey into the tournament. We've subsequently had the likes of Mark Chapman, Lockie Ferguson, now uh, Matt Henry, as you mentioned, go down with with some injuries, I actually think that Carl Jamieson coming over uh, is a sign that that he will actually come into the uh, into the squad. Uh, we're waiting for the results on on Matt Henry. They may be out. Actually, I haven't seen an update. Um, it is a big concern for for a number of reasons. The the main one being that even when Southey came back, he looked underdone in that game uh, that they just played against South Africa. Kane Williamson's had one game, two games, uh, you know, and then a massive stretch before that where he hasn't played. Uh, when's the last time Kyle Jamieson played white ball cricket? Uh, there's a lot of players who have not played a lot of cricket lately and definitely not to a World Cup semi-final standard that they need to be. So it's a massive concern. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like we can't have the balance conversation either because it's almost like which players are actually fully fit and available. Uh, Ish Sodi, uh, I'm hoping that he comes into the side and he... I'm sure that he has been preparing and being ready to make an impact on these Indian pitches. And I think he's going to be sorely needed uh, as this tournament sort of closes out. Uh, But yeah, massive concerns from me. Uh, I can't even have that balance conversation anymore because I don't know which, which players are actually available. Uh, It comes down to, we've just got to do the job with the bat and we've got to tidy up our fielding. It was better against Africa, but it was a really uh, sore point for me against, against Australia. Over to you, Baldy. Similar concerns about balance, Raj, for Australia. Maxwell gives us so much with bat and ball. Yes, he might helicopter one up in the air first cherry, but he can also get 100 off 40 balls. So batting at six or seven, that's uh, a really unique offering that Maxwell can give us. And uh, as was pointed out in the Murdoch press this morning, if you can't deal with the no-show, then you can't deal with the big show. Unfortunately, he does join Josh Inglis and Johnny Besto, as you said, Adam, in the list of golfers in the last 18 months to suffer cricket injuries. I mean, cricketers to suffer golfing injuries, which is really unfortunate for him. He'll be back after eight or 10 days as he goes through that concussion protocol. He'll miss the England game. As you said, Adam Mitchell Marsh also has flown home to Perth for family reasons and will miss the England game as well. He said to his teammates, and Marcus Stoinis has reported it through the media, that he'll be back for this World Cup. So that's good news for both the Marsh family and for cricket in Australia as well. But it means that Manus Labashain probably earned yet another concussion reprieve. He was probably the first in line to be replaced by the return of Marcus Stoinis from a niggling calf injury. And he probably would have been the man to miss out had Mitchell Marsh batted at three or four for Australia. So uh, without being flippant, and and it's not nice to have concussion and it's never nice to joke about head injury. But if someone can tell Marnus that he's coming in for Glenn Maxwell because Glenn Maxwell has concussion, it may see yet another uh, resurgence in form and performance from Marnus Labuschagne. And Australia are going to need him against England. Steve Smith will go back to three Marnus will probably bat somewhere in that 4-5 spot in the middle order for Australia. But we're going to need to see some runs from from those two, and I mean Smith and Marnus, in this game against England. If Australia are to win the game and lock their spot into the semi-finals, and what I'm hoping for is that Marnus gets uh, going 
and gets 60 off 50 like he did the other day instead of his strike rate of 65-70, which has proved to be quite the handbrake on Australia's run yeah. towards, as you say, Raj, pushing forward for that 90-100 off the last 10 overs to get towards 350, which I think Australia are going to need to put England out of the game. Yeah. Well, look, I guess from an English perspective, I'm just hoping we can play spoiler to that Australian um, campaign. Um, boys, I think we've, yeah, we've talked um, enough about the game today and probably what's coming up over the next uh, few days. Breaking news is that Cricket Australia um, have now banned golf carts and have actually employed caddies for the rest of the tour. So the players need to walk the course uh, to save their legs, but they'll have someone to carry them, uh, carry the ping irons around. Um, but boys, unless there's anything else from, from you, um, we will uh, bid farewell to the pod. Please do dip back into the back catalogue. Um, if you do want to listen to some World Cup chat, uh, Mike Hussey is a, a must listen um, on our audio channels. We've also got a video um, of our Zoom call with him up there, as well as many more cricketing uh, news, views and interviews from the archives for you to dip into in between. Uh, in between games in this World Cup that are coming thick and fast. Um, but for now, it is good morning. Good bless from us all here in Auckland. And we'll see you um, on our weekend editions where you'll see the facial hair um, take slightly less care um, and probably some bleary eyes on the on the Sunday morning after that, uh, uh, that double header. Um, but for now, we'll see you on the Top Order podcast next time. See you later.